Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, very nice to see people gathering. Hi, Gabor. Hi, Judy. Mariana, what a surprise. Hello. Hi, Cliff. Hi. Can you hear me? Absolutely. And may I introduce you to the others because you are a very special guest. Clifford Davidson from uh, Michigan, Kal Kalamazoo, was my first scholarly contact in America, whom I met in 1980. So our friendship is 51 year old at the moment. Great to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hi, Martha. See you, Judy. Yeah. Hello, Marcel. Hi, Noel. Daisy. Hello. <laughs> Glad to see you. Absolutely. See you and good to hear you. Yes, and apparently everybody is healthy, no COVID victims. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> you, never, you never know. <laughs> well, just turned out that uh, in the stadium there were some COVID uh, infected people <laughs> in the French Hungarian football. Is it, is it today? I, is it in the moment? I didn't even no, know. No, no, no. no. Was, it was, it was on Sat yes, I, Saturday. I the German. Is excuse for the loss. That, that will be next uh, tomorrow. Oh, the German, okay. Hungarian. Yeah. yeah. Hello, Choba Matzelka. My dear ex student. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, well, yeah. thank you for coming. Yeah, I think I think we can start. I think we can start. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, uh, book uh, launch, which is uh, one of the last events uh, of our departments this academic year. I'm Gabor Klanitsoy, head of the Medieval Studies Department at CEU, and this. Uh, Book launch is uh, organized together with uh, the Department of History and also the Religious Studies Center. And uh, it is uh, uh, to a very special occasion. Jörg uh, Sönyi, uh, uh, who is a, a visiting professor at uh, both of our departments and is also an important participant of the Religious Studies program, had a few years an uh, excellent PhD student, Noel Putnik from Serbia, and uh, uh, their uh, uh, work together resulted also in a, a, a very, very, uh, I would say, welcome uh, return uh, from uh, Noel, uh, Noel uh, and uh, he uh, decided to translate uh, one of the books of and Sony, and uh, this is being presented. Now, uh, I would like to uh, uh, first of all present the two uh, uh, heroes of uh, tonight. Uh, uh, the translator Noel Putnik is an alumnus of the Medieval Studies Department. Uh, his PhD was in 2018, and he wrote his dissertation. dissertation. On, pardon? Uh, he wrote his dissertation on, uh, on Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, and uh, he teaches classics now at the secondary school in Belgrade, mm -hmm. and uh, is also working for a publishing house uh, uh, of the humanities, and uh, he's uh, also the author of several books and translator of classical texts. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, author of uh, the book he has translated, Jordi Andresuni is uh, so about him. Uh, 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 let me uh, tell a few things. Uh, he has a very long CV, and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, known uh, each other and been friends uh, with each other for several decades. So uh, uh, he is a, a professor uh, originally at uh, the University of Seged, uh, where he was uh, also uh, at one point uh, head of the English department, vice dean of faculty of arts, uh, and uh, director of the Institute of English and American Studies. He uh, also uh, came to CEU as visiting professor uh, since 2006. 2006. Uh, as uh, 
it is a, it is a, a, a 15 year period that we have uh, closely worked together here and he has supervised several of our students no, no among them. and uh, since uh, 2021 uh, he is uh, uh, emeritus uh, now uh, uh, now uh, uh, about his works uh, uh, besides uh, the book which is being uh, uh, presented here, uh, this uh, John Dee's Occultism, uh, uh, Occultism, Magical Exaltation Through Powerful Science, which will be uh, presented, uh, I suppose, in detail. Let me, uh, let me mention very briefly that he started his, uh, his academic career by a, a small booklet uh, about secret sciences and uh, superstitions, uh, which was actually uh, throwing uh, light and uh, trying to uh, make uh, known in Hungary uh, the work of uh, Francis Yates and uh, also this huge branch of uh, scholarship uh, related to her and to the Warburg Institute and to early modern uh, magical sciences and occultism. And he then uh, uh, published several, uh, uh, several books on this in Hungarian, also in Italian, also in English, and uh, uh, on uh, the occult uh, uh, symbolism. And his uh, most important hero in the work was uh, John Dee. I want to mention about him also that he, uh, uh, although he is now called Emeritus, he has uh, four books in preparation, so he has not stopped working at all, and he is also continuing supervising some of our PhD students. And he is uh, also a very, very prolific organizer, not only of PhD studies and university education and his own research, but also a uh, book series that he has edited on iconography and uh, on magic in Seged. And, uh, so he has 19 uh, edited books, but I won't take the time any longer because I want to uh, give them the word. Now, it is called panel, and uh, this was the idea of Yuri, and uh, I don't know, uh, maybe he will have a very precise idea, but I think uh, in the first place, uh, what we would like to hear is uh, uh, some words about this book and uh, some words how the translator so the book. Now, since this is the presentation of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of, of of the translation of Noel Putnik, maybe I should uh, give him the word first uh, to tell about this experience, how it was to study with Yuri, how it was to translate this book, and what is the significance of this book in your in your own uh, uh, research uh, and in uh, as you see it. And then uh, uh, we would turn uh, also to Yuri, who, uh, who can then uh, tell what made him uh, so uh, interested and fascinated with John Dee. And then there is something which is called panel, where two participants unfortunately uh, uh, couldn't come, but Marcel Sheböck is here, who is also uh, 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 in our Department of Medieval Studies, and uh, we will have uh, Noel as participant of the uh, uh, panel, and we have a very prestigious audience who is also invited to come in. So, please, Noel, uh, tell them. Thank you very much, Gabor, and, and uh, hello, greetings from Belgrade. Uh, thank you all for coming today to this presentation. Uh, I'm very glad, I have to say, I'm very glad to see some familiar faces again after a long and stressful yeah. period. <laughs> and I hope that you're all well. Uh, I don't know if you hear me well, because uh, I seem to have some problems with my connection. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. we hear you. Uh, so I'm even happier that we meet on the occasion of uh, presenting the Serbian translation of Professor George Sunji's book on John Dee. Uh, the book was published in January this year uh, by a prestigious Serbian publishing house, uh, Fedon from Belgrade. and. Uh, I have to say I'm very happy because uh, the publication of this book marks the completion of a very long process and also for the fulfillment of a long desire that I had. Uh, 
So I will try in the next 10 to 15 minutes, depending on my efficiency, to uh, explain some reasons why I picked up this particular book and what is the context of the translation, etc. I prepared a small, very basic uh, PowerPoint presentation, which I will uh, <clears throat> turn on now. And uh, you will tell me if you see anything in a second. Okay. So that it can facilitate my small question. Good. Can you can you see it? Yes. Great. Yes. yes. So uh, first of all, here we see the original and the translation, and you might have noticed that the Serbian title is uh, a bit different from the original, so I need to explain it a little bit. Trust me, it is the same book. Uh, however, the thing is that the original title, sim title simply didn't sound uh, well enough in Serbian uh, due to the spirit of the language, of its poetics, its modes of expression. So I had to rephrase it a little bit. I hope not too much. Uh, also, I was keen to make the central theme of uh, uh, Sonia's book, uh, that of uh, exaltation, as clear and as attractive as possible for the not so experienced uh, public in Serbia. Uh, and you can see the subtitle from Science to Magic, Magic, the case of an Elizabethan humanist, which is also different from the, the original subtitle for the same reason. Uh, but let me begin first with a few personal remarks before I move on to a more general consideration of the translation and its context. Uh, one of the main uh, academic uh, interests, areas of my academic interest, as you could see on the presentation uh, poster, is the work of uh, Cornelius Agrippa, famous uh, Renaissance humanist and uh, magician occultist, but also of other Renaissance humanists who were interested in various forms of religious uh, syncretism and in what we nowadays term esotericism. So when I came to see you, I was really very, very fortunate to meet Georgi there. First of all, because of the finest academic guidance and support that I received from him. Uh, but Georgi was not only a dedicated uh, supervisor, we also became, fr became friends and colleagues. And our cooperation has continued up to the present day. So in this sense, uh, you can view this, this translation as a continuation of that cooperation. Also as uh, my attempt to reciprocate somehow, but also to con contribute to our common cause, about which I will say something later. Uh, another important thing in my uh, relationship with Georgi was uh, the almost perfect matching of our academic interest, which is not so, doesn't happen so often in, in with students, I, I think. I remember when I first uh, read Georgi's book on John Dee, I was amazed to see how close his approach was to what I wanted to achieve in my own book on work on Agrippa. Uh, one of Agrippa's central ideas, that of magical ascension, closely corresponded to what Georgi termed the notion of exaltation in John D. D's thought, together with uh, what uh, Georgi terms uh, the, the perfect ambi ambiguity in his uh, intellectual position. And uh, in many other ways, uh, Mm -hmm. This intellectual into development was very similar to Agrippa's, not to mention that Agrippa influenced him as one of his main sources, as Georgi discusses at length in his book. So I realized from the very beginning the importance of Georgi's books for my own, my own work, and it came to me as a natural idea to make that book known to the Serbian academic community, as well as to the general public, of course. Uh, for me, it was also a way to make a more solid ground for my own study in a field that is virtually terra incognita in Serbian scholarship. So there is another aspect to it. Uh, let me mention that a year and a half ago, I published my own book on Cornelius Agrippa in Serbian. This is it. The title is uh, Between Hermes and uh, Christ. It was closely based on my doc doctoral dissertation. So... Uh, the translation of Georgi's book came as a continuation of my effort to turn the scholarly attention, the attention of the local scholarly community to this neglected field, uh, to somehow fill in that gap. And I think that these two books uh, work together quite well and nicely delineate a scholarly field as such. 
Uh, in addition, Georgie's book has a huge advantage that it could make it that could make it appealing to a more general public. Uh, the first part of the book is an overview of the main philosophical and esoteric ideas that uh, influenced John Dee from the antiquity through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance up to his own time. Uh, this, this part of the book seemed to me as a perfect introduction to the field for all those who are not familiar with it or not familiar enough. In the manner of a textbook, it gradually moves from Plato, Neoplatonists, and Corpus Hermeticum to mention just a few instances. Uh, through various forms of medieval magic, the influence of the Picatrix, uh, the Jewish and Arabic influences, up to the Plor Florentine Neoplatonist, Tritemius, Paracelsus, Agrippa, and D himself. So it's really like a textbook that is very, very useful for introducing a whole new field in a scholarly way, to be more precise. Because in uh, uh, you have plenty of pseudo scholarly works, of course, which do not have do not serve the same the same uh, need. Another advantage of George's uh, book is that it deals in much detail with uh, John Dee's activities in East Central Europe, partly also Slavic Europe, which I thought could be even more appealing and interesting to the Serbian readership. Uh, here you can see on the right hand side a page from uh, George's original book and that starts the discussion about these activities in East Central Europe. So we can follow his wanderings around Poland, Bohemia, his dealings with the adventurous Count Lasky, uh, his relationship with uh, Rudolf II, with some Hungarian noblemen and humanists, etc. So I thought that this geographical closeness might contribute to the relevance of George's book you know, in the eyes of this Serbian audience. Uh, and then, moreover, in the methodology section, you can see it on the left-hand side, which is very interesting to me. It was very interesting. Georgi uh, also reflects on his position as a scholar from an ex-communist country, uh, which might have a lot in common with the Serbian experience in the field of humanities. I believe that many middle-aged and older readers would relate to uh, Georgi's own perspective and situation, and in this way they could more appreciate his argument. And also I thought that it would be really amazing to present a scholar from this part of Europe, from relatively speaking, a small country who uh, choose a topic that is intellectually speaking of a global reach and who produced a significant relevant scholarly output in this field. Uh, so in addition to the main theme, which is of course the most important, these are all advantages, I believe, that could make the book even more appealing in Serbia to the Serbian readers. However, John Dee is already a familiar character among Serbian readers. Uh, they first came to know about him from Gustav Meiring's novel, The Angel of the West Window, which had a few editions in Serbia, and then also from the translated works of Francis Yates, we have several of them, and some other books as well. I have to say that in my opinion, Agrippa is somewhat better known as he features in the novels of some of the prominent Serbian writers, as well as in The Fiery Angel, a novel by the Russian uh, author, Valery Brusov, which had a consider considerable influence in Serbia. Thus, there is a whole range of esoteric personalities and topics such as the Kabbalah, Theosophy, Gnosticism, appearing in the works of some mainstream Serbian novelists and poets, not only in translated books. This was recently shown by my colleague Nemanja Radulovic in his groundbreaking study, The Undercurrent. And Nemanja uh, argumented in a very systematic way the presence of all these esoteric topics uh, in the Serbian literary culture, so to speak, in the Serbian literary uh, space. Uh, so you can find and Agrippa, John D. Paracelsus, Tritemius, all of them showing up, you know, surfacing in various uh, novels, poems, etc. Um, thus, I wouldn't say that the general Serbian readership or intellectual readership, at least, hasn't been interested in this kind of topics. On the contrary, what really catches the eye is the almost complete lack of any academic treatment of these topics in Serbian contemporary scholarship. Apart from a few scholars and myself, you will not find anyone in Serbia who publishes scholarly works on esotericism. In other words, there is clearly a lacuna in scholarship, which I hope George's book, but my book as well, might fill in to some extent. 
So uh, speaking of that lacuna, uh, some years ago, in one of the volumes of uh, the Annual of Medial Studies at CEU, my colleague, uh, Nada Zecic, gave a very good overview of present-day Serbian scholarship in the field of medieval studies. Uh, her main point was that this scholarship is mostly confined to the history of medieval Serbia and the region, especially the Byzantine Empire. I might add that uh, the scope of Renaissance studies in Serbia as a distinct field is even more limited. And uh, as I said, it is even more true for the academic studies of Western esotericism. Of course, you can find historians of literature, even some prominent ones dealing with Shakespeare, Marlowe, Dante, Boccaccio, all those great names of literature, but you will find no one to deal with those murky characters such as John Dee, Agrippa, Pico, Paracelsus, Tritemius, etc. So in other words, Serbian humanistic scholarship, at least considering historical studies, is still strongly conditioned by its historical limitations, both in terms of its national and regional orientation and its, uh, and its disregard for topics labeled as not serious enough. In this uh, context, I hope that my translation of Judy's book will attract at least some scholarly attention. Now, there is an academic framework that I consider important for my work in this area. It is a young branch of uh, intellectual history that has come to be known as the academic studies of esotericism. Here in Europe, it is represented by the European Society for the Academic Studies of Esotericism, or ESVI, which is seated in Amsterdam. Here you can see the main page of uh, their website. It has its annual journal, Arias, published by Brill. It holds big biannual conferences in addition to many other activities. It also has a number of topical and regional branches, one of which is the Central and Eastern European Network for the Academic Study of Western Esotericism, which was founded at CEU in 2014. Uh, what you see now is the main page of our website, the website of the uh, central, I won't repeat it again. And as you can see, it's a pretty nasty abbreviation, not so easy to, to memorize. So this is the regional or the local branch of the SV. And I can say that we already have three biannual conferences and two volumes uh, behind us. Uh, this network was founded on the initiative of Jurt Suni who served as a longtime member on the SV board. Here you can see the founding meeting, which took place in Budapest seven years ago at CEU. Uh, you can see Georgi in the middle. So he was the mastermind of this uh, whole enterprise. And uh, in short, I see this translation and also my book as fitting into that academic and intellectual milieu, for which, as I let me say it once again, uh, Georgi was instrumental really uh, he was, his uh, role was indispensable. Uh, finally, in the end, let me add that this whole enterprise was only made possible by, with the support of a dedicated publisher. Uh, Fedon is one of the most esteemed publishers in Serbia in the field of humanities. In 2012, it won the award of the International Be Belgrade Book Fair as the best publisher of the year. I can show you some of the editions. It specializes in works of psychology, philosophy, religious studies, cultural anthropology, intellectual history. Uh, you can see some of the books here. It's only a tiny portion of all the editions. It has several book series. Uh, you can see The Two King's Body by Kantorowicz. You can see Truth and Method by Gadamer. Also uh, Jung's uh, lectures on Nietzsche and his Zarathustra. Uh, Fedon also has a book series dedicated to the works of uh, Greek and Roman classical authors, and uh, it publishes them bilingually, which is really rare in Serbia. I can give you an example of uh, uh, Virgil, the NA, the brand new edition, a translation of the NA was published a few years ago by Fedon. And uh, Georgie's book, book was published in a book series titled Persephone. Uh, one of the recent editions in this series was Edgar Lind's Pagan Mysteries in the Renaissance, which you can see in the middle here on the screen. You can recognize uh, the, uh, uh, the appearance of the, of the book series. And uh, on the right side, you can see Pierre Ado, uh, The Inner Fortress, his introduction to the uh, meditations of Marcus Aurelius. 
So I'm very happy that Georgie's book has become part of this collection and I hope it will have a great life among its readers. Thank you very much for your attention. That's what I have to say for the moment. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Noel, for this presentation. I think this is uh, one of the uh, uh, most interesting uh, and uh, also rewarding things for us uh, to hear how a field, which is also uh, cultivated and promoted by uh, uh, our colleagues and uh, is also uh, made uh, popular among our students, is then, uh, is then uh, uh, continued or uh, uh, broadened uh, or uh, echoed in a, a whole country's uh, uh, academic life. And uh, I did hear a lot of uh, uh, some of these authors like Nemanja Radulovic, and I heard also uh, Judy's uh, foundation uh, uh, acts of this, uh, I cannot say the abbreviation by heart, uh, C-E-N-A-S-W-E, uh, 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 but uh, uh, what, uh, what we could see really, and uh, for years, and also in workshops and also in other forms, is that uh, this theme uh, is uh, maintained in the interest of CEU on the one hand, and this is also, uh, uh, also uh, gaining popularity as well. I also uh, appreciate uh, uh, your uh, references to the editors. I think a, a book presentation should celebrate the publisher. And uh, if there is a publisher specialized in such uh, good, uh, uh, or at least uh, for us, interesting things, then uh, they should be uh, congratulated. Now, at this point, uh, uh, let me then uh, ask Yuri how he could, uh, he could react to this and what would be his, uh, his own uh, take uh, of the subject. And maybe, uh, Yuri, you could tell a few things about your interest in John Dee and uh, how you thought uh, uh, that this would be a topic uh, worth uh, studying and uh, publishing. Thank you very much, Gabor. First of all, I have to admit that I'm very moved by Noel's speech, uh, which was not only an excellent scholarly introduction, but also a very heartwarming testimony. And I think that uh, a teacher cannot wish for more than such relationships that what I have with, with Noel for many years. I... Uh, also made a little uh, PowerPoint presentation. And fortunately, partly Gabor's introduction, partly Noel's uh, speech already make, make it redundant. But anyway, I'm going to show you this screen on which I, uh, in fact, try to summarize the genesis of the book, uh, in what way I found important to introduce certain methodological and, and, uh, and uh, ideological uh, trends in that book and finally a little bit about the structure of the book which actually was already mentioned by uh, by noel so uh, we have to go back quite a lot in time to the 1970s when i was still a student at the university of Szeged, and my good fortune brought me together with one of the great uh, hungarian renaissance scholars tibor klonitsai who when i was a third year student gave me the book of francis yates it's uh, on uh, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic tradition. And that reading uh, completely reformed my way of thinking about the Renaissance in which I was very much interested already at that time and uh, put me on a track which uh, in a way is still going on, of course, with several bends and, uh, uh, and um, uh, forks and whatever. So... Um, what was interesting in the Yatesian approach in the 1970s, that it seemed to be a very new approach to Renaissance magic and esotericism in the sense that it uh, counterbalanced or it went contrary to traditional science history. Traditional science history would say that we are not interested in magic, it's a murky uh, uninteresting thing and only that is interesting which emerged out of it as rational 
enlightened whatever science. Uh, this Yeatsian approach was built on an intellectual trend called the Warburg School or the Warburgian approach. And in that sense, in the 1970s, I became very much attracted to this Warburgian intellectual history. Uh, it was also very important for me in Hungary and coming from a Hungarian uh, intellectual context, because as you know, at that time, Hungary was still part of the socialist camp. And uh, there was a certain obligatory Marxism and dialectical materialism. And the Warburgian school seemed to be a nice way of diverting from those uh, compulsory ideological trends. And I have to tell at this point that Tibor Klonica was very instrumental in keeping Renaissance studies free of uh, ideological constraints. We had Renaissance conferences at that time into which uh, all sorts of scholars, including uh, various priests and clerical figures were also free to enter. And we had a, a marvelous atmosphere of free discussion and free thinking in that circle. Now, why John D? How did I hit up on John D? My first uh, university degrees were uh, Hungarian and English literature. And uh, I always uh, thought it important to find such a topic in which I could connect these two fields. So uh, I was very much interested in English culture and John D as a Renaissance uh, scholar and interesting uh, cultural historical character was in a way a very interesting choice, but it also motivated me that John D came to Central Europe, had some Hungarian acquaintances, even briefly visited Hungary at some point. So that seemed to be an excellent uh, kind of combination of topics. And last but not least, in 1981, Frances Yates visited in Hungary for a week and I was her personal escort. Uh, by the way, I'm very glad to see Tibor Fabini in the public now who was also helping in that and he spent a memorable day with Yates in Visegrad and other places on the excursion. So uh, another interesting feature of these D studies is the reconfiguration of the D image. I've always been very much interested in historiography, how the same phenomenon attracted uh, scholars later on to certain opinions and these opinions are changing over time and can be even contrary to each other. So uh, John D. not as a John D. figure was interesting for me, but as a John D. figure of several centuries and several generations of interpreters. In the 19th century, uh, John D. was uh, usually um, uh, evaluated as a deluded scholar who started scholarship. Uh, he did interesting things in Renaissance mathematics, geography, scientific language, but then he kind of went mad and uh, got imbued in magic and angel magic and uh, people didn't really like to talk about this part of John D's career, rather um, at, at least mentioning it as a curiosity, as a strange curios, uh, curiosity. Then came the Warburgian image and the Warburgian image, including Francis Yates, uh, tried to bridge in one way or another the magical thinking, the, the so-called pre-modern way of thinking with the scientific revolution and the emergence of, of rationalism. Uh, let me mention another name, Paolo Rossi, an Italian scholar who in 1968 published a book on Francis Bacon, and he gave the subtitle to the book, Francis Bacon from Magic to Science. So that seemed to be a kind of opening <laughs> which in a way tried to legitimize the non-strictly rationalistic scientific efforts of the pre-modern era. And Yeats did more or less the same with her Bruno book in 1964, and uh, she wrote a lot about John Dee, and she also uh, introduced an interesting uh, concept, namely that the modern academia and the cooperation of science uh, scientists can be also connected to the esoteric trend. So she made a kind of grand narrative from the Rosicrucian secret society to the Royal Society of Britain. This uh, idea was very much contested later on, but in, in, at that time, the 1970s, it seemed to be a very revolutionary step forward. Then from the late 1980s came the so-called post-war Burgian revisionism. And I can illustrate this by a few titles. One of the key figures in the reinterpretation of John Dee was Nicholas Cluley, who published the book in 1988 with the title 
between science and religion. So you can see that it's not from magic to science, but somehow religion is getting on a more or less equal plane and equal prestige with science in the title of this book. Uh, another uh, good book from that time, 1999, uh, Deborah Harkness published a book on the, which focused on apocalypticism. And then came my monograph in the series, 2004, in which I, uh, although I didn't give the subtitle, but actually no, I used this phrase in the translation, from science to magic. So we are reversing the order, not from magic to science, but from, from science to magic. Why is it interesting? It seems to be a very retrograde dead end, you might say. But apparently, if we look at later cultural history from the 18th century, 19th century, and even today, even the New Age uh, uh, intellectual context, or, or what we can uh, call, uh, here is in the next point, the mention of the term uh, re-enchantment. The re-enchantment as a kind of counterpoint to Max Weber's famous idea of disenchantment, getting humanity and especially European culture getting out of religiousness. Now uh, it has been proved that it doesn't work. It didn't work that way. And there's an English scholar, Christopher Partridge, who in 2000 and books, uh, 2006 uh, <clears throat> published a famous book uh, called The, the Reenchantment of the World. And he created the term occulture, occult culture, as a kind of important feature of, of today's culture. So if we want to look for the origins of this occulture, we have to go back to the 16th century, to the Renaissance Magi, and, uh, and uh, especially in the 17th century, when this kind of uh, esoteric worldview or Western esotericism turns into a kind of counterculture, a competitor, and, and uh, in a way, a victim of rationalism and modern science. So that fascinated me, and I tried to put John D in such a context. That's my last uh, slide, and I can do it very quickly. So basically, what I found necessary is a heterogeneous methodology to, to work with this very complex uh, phenomenon, and John D is a kind of tip of the iceberg. So re really, we are talking about the whole trend of thinking and many figures in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. Intellectual history, cultural history, theories of symbols and symbolization, religious studies, historical anthropology, all of these had a part, had a, a smaller or greater part in my investigations. Now, I think one of my most important uh, notions was the concept of exaltatio, and fortunately no one mentioned that, this ambiguous program which I understand as a combination of pious religiosity and at the same time, a kind of hubris and superbia. Uh, so in a way, uh, a, a Faustian program, which can be white or black, and it has become a kind of archetypal um, model for, for Western intellectuals, at least since the time of the Renaissance. Another interesting aspect of these studies is uh, book culture, the studies of book culture, Renaissance book culture, and the Republic of Letters. Dee had one of the largest private libraries in England, 4,000 volumes, and that was very sizable in Europe as well. And he had a huge correspondence with all sorts of European intellectuals. He uh, took several grand tours into different parts of Europe, and finally he lived uh, three and a half years uh, or oh, four years practically in, in Krakow, Prague. Uh, he may, came to Bratislava, etc., etc. So the Central European experience. And finally, uh, I have to go back to the question of historiography, the trends of interpretation, competing grand narratives, because as we could see, even from my, my brief summary, that in different periods, uh, in different intellectual atmospheres, the figure of John, the, the role of Renaissance magic was seen in completely different lights. And to see this, uh, the changing of this light uh, is for me at least very, very interesting and, and a good lesson. Now, the, the structure of the book was relatively simple. In the first part, I gave definition, mostly concentrating on the doctrine of exaltatio. And the next two parts are called input and output. Input meaning John these readings, and I tried to reconstruct John these minds through his readings and the books what we had in his library, and that gave me a good occasion practically to 
to give that uh, introduction to, to the general trends of, of magic up to the Renaissance. Noel very nicely summarized that actually a few minutes ago. And in the third part of the book, the output considers and concentrates on, on uh, drawing these works and also on the interpretive community, how he was accepted by his contemporaries and by later generations. And there's a little um, kind of appendix to the book in which I analyze a stanza from Edmund Spencer, the famous English poet uh, of the Fairy Queen, a long epic poem. And there is a very interesting and intriguing mystical stanza in that. And I try to bring it together with, with John Dee's mathematical magic. So that's, that's what I can say now. And of course, I will be very happy to answer questions or humbly receive criticisms. Thank you very much, Yuri. Uh, we have a, not only a book presentation here, but actually a nice uh, panel already uh, on the topic of uh, uh, John Dee and uh, Renaissance esotericism. We are in the middle of a, a subject. And uh, now uh, I think uh, uh, we should open uh, some discussion. And uh, uh, this is the point where I should like to ask Marcel Shebuk, who is, uh, was foreseen to be part of this panel and is here with us. Uh, uh, maybe he can uh, give some reflections to what we heard from uh, Noel and Yuri and then uh, we will open some broader discussion on, around this question. Thank you, Gabor. And first of all, let me uh, just express my uh, gratitude and congratulate to both the translator and the author for this achievement. And I'm very glad that, uh, as, as Noel explained, that uh, the context to which the, the book of Yuri arrives now, or has already arrived, is a very, very, uh, I think, uh, a very good uh, uh, um, series of titles. And then I think, and then I do hope that there will be a good receptions uh, for this book too, uh, within this new context. Um, since there was no no strict or not no any instruction beforehand that what should I contribute as part of this panel, <laughs> I I'd like to reflect uh, most uh, mostly what Yuri emphasized when he introduced the book itself and the structure and especially that part which is about the book culture and the. East Central European intellectual life. And even more, I, I prepared a short text and uh, which is which is very much related, of course, to the book. And and the moreover, I, I just gave a uh, a title to this little contribution, which says that uh, which is a question. Did John D and Andreas do each ever meet? Uh, I have chosen this because uh, there are many overlaps and, and then also in Yuri's book there are certain uh, certain uh, references and, and quotations and, uh, and contextualization of, of these two persons. And when I was preparing for this book launch, I, of course, I was pondering among possible topics and approaches too, whether I can offer a comment or a series of comments on something which bears a strong visual aspect, having known Yuri's scholarly interest, or on some Renaissance and historical topics, or anything like this. Um, but above all, I, I remember that uh, there, is a, there is a very characteristic statement in Yuri's book, and I now quote it. John Dee was a notorious visitor of his Central European courts with a strange mystical chiliastic message based on his conversation with angels, end quote. So I decided to bring a very brief case study here about our shared historical region, East Central Europe, as it was visited and inhabited by many citizens of the Republic of Letters, one of the chapters dedicated to these two. Uh, so, 
In the course of remembering, uh, of course, I, I, I recall the first Hungarian version of the book and then the consequent expanded English one that was mentioned and that was published in 2004 and then in 2010 in a paperback format. I have used this latter version recently when I completed an article, Andreas Dudic, a contemporary Hungarian-born politician and erudite humanist with an extremely large network of contacts. Since I also remember that during the grand European tours of Philip Sidney and later of John Dee, they might have met in Dudic's house in Breslau, present-day Wroclaw. So I checked the pages in Julie's English book and realized that Dudic referred to, quote, Dominus D. Anglus Mathematicus in a letter to Tadeusz Hayek Hagetius, who was a Prague-based imperial astronomer, whose house D spent some days then. In this letter, composed on December 20th, on, uh, on December 20th, 1585, Dudic mentioned D with great admiration and asked Hagetius to inquire John D whether he could recommend him a resident mathematician to whom he was willing to offer a respectable salary. Dudic also wrote to Francesco Pucci, a Florentine patrician, whom he seems also to have esteemed, and asked him the same, that is, to suggest a mathematician to satisfy his personal educational plans. For many years then, Dudic had desperately tried to find companion of well-prepared mathematicians and astronomers and relied on, his, relied on his various English and other European contacts in his search because he decided to be a scholar of celestial spheres to be a trained astronomer. It happened in a period of his life when he had already published an erudite and a critical manifesto, a short commentary on the comet of 1577. It, and it was mostly against the superstitious explanations of heavenly phenomenon uh, uh, by using this occasion. His efforts to become a member of the community of astronomers has failed, though he remained a respected member of the Republic of Letters, whose Breslau house and library which was even bigger than that of John Dee, was open for learned travelers like Dee. It seems, and Yuri's book confirms this assumption, that John Dee had not visited Andreas Dudic during the years he traveled in East Central Europe, though Dudic mentions him in a letter again to Hagetius on July the 3rd, 1587. The Anglis Multa Audivi, I have heard a lot about the Englishman says Dudic and continues as follows. All of these seem puzzling and little credible to me, since some people are determined that he speaks with the angels, I do not know whom to believe, end quote. And Dudic goes on, on by, goes on by discussing the alchemical term, chrysopoeia, which refers to the artificial production of gold, and most commonly by the alleged transportation of base metals such as lead, plus the adamant, a legendary rock or mineral to which many properties were attributed. During the spiritual sessions organized by Dee and Edward Kelly, they made use of this holy stone, the adamant, through which they could see angels and communicate with them. But the spirits, in fact, returned mere coal, carbon, and even this coal burned into ashes. This proof for du proofs for Dudic, without hiding his displeasure, that both Dee and Kelly practice black magic and not science. A shift of perception and opinion about Dee seems understandable since at the beginning of the uh, 1580s, Dudic sought knowledgeable experts for improving his mathematical and astronomical capacities. And that is why John Dee was amongst those scholars and Dudic also asked this favor from a number of his correspondents, whom he expected a recommended person. But some years later, he became skeptical and sarcastic about those practitioners in science who had not met the high standards required for a cutting and scholarship of the day, the one Dudic never pursued. There could be another reason that fed Dudic's irritation towards John Dee. And I quote again the book of Yuri. While at home, Dee collected books, organized the private academy, managed geographical expeditions, and had suggested the reform of the calendar. 
He did little of this sort in Eastern Europe. He did not even practice the occult art in that complex, esoteric humanist form as he had previously at home. His message for Eastern Europe was a mystical, religious lesson, but without the innovative dogmatics of the radical reformers who temporarily camped in Poland or in Hungary, the Socinis, Paleologus, or Franken. In fact, D was abhorred by the vistas of skeptical anti-Trinitarianism, end quote. And that time, Andreas Dudic, who left the Catholic Church for the sake of his liberty and the marriage with a Polish noblewoman, was rather sympathetic with the teachings of anti-Trinitarianism, though he never converted to any of the denominations of the Protestant Church. Besides the two mentions in Yuri's book, however, there are some more reflections from Dudic on John Dee. Thanks to the recently and finally published critical edition of the full correspondence of Dudic, appeared two years ago, one can explore some more references than two on John Dee, such as the letter by, to Johannes Pretorius, a professor of mathematics at the University of Aldorf, on October 9th, 1584. When Dudic informs his friend that, quote, he heard about the, the mathematician of London who was in Krakow, and he also refers here to Obrach Lasky, who sponsored these performance there. On November the 20th in the same year, he mentions again the celebrated English mathematician, John Dee in a letter to NN, this monogram just there, without the full name. On the same day, Dudic composed another letter to Peter Mona of Breslau, in which he refers to this period in Krakow again. On December 12th, in another letter to Pretorius, the dish mentions that he knew about this day in Krakow and Prague. On December 20th and 24th, the dish letters to Peter Mano expressed a desire to know and see everything about these affairs. On January 14th, 1585, the dish wrote to Jacques Bongard, a French humanist diplomat, and referred to John Dee again with some esteem. Out of these seven new references on John Dee by Andreas Dudic, all of them dated for 1584 and early 1585, therefore all of them before the first letter mentioned in Dudic's book, it looks obvious that Dudic follows John Dee's activities and places where he stayed and he might want to meet him in person, not just through intermediaries and common acquaintances. It also seems obvious that he never accomplished this effort. In a similar fashion, there is no record about the possible approach on his behalf towards Dudic. All in all, and this is the answer, what the title suggested, it seems quite apparent that John Dee and Andreas Dudic had never met, though they could have come across many times. So finally, what I can say, Lectori salutam in Serbia now, and at the same time we salute the author and the translator to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Martel. Uh, and uh, thank you for this rejoinder. Actually, it shows uh, that uh, once uh, serious uh, 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 activities start around the book, such as a translation, and uh, uh, also uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, see the field uh, uh, in uh, a connection with this, then uh, other people get inspired. And thank you, Marcel, for this rejoinder and inspiration and uh, this small qu a small question, which then might also stimulate some other <coughs> comments. So uh, at this point, I would say that, uh, let me open the, uh, the floor. And uh, I already see the hand of Danuta Schanzer, uh, who I welcome here uh, and Please take the word. Hi, Gabor. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. This is a, I think this is a question, question for, for Yuri. I haven't read your book. Please forgive me. But one thing kind of intrigues me. Years ago, when I was young and I was working on Alain de Lille's Anticlaudianus, I, I was dealing with a, with a cotton manuscript um, from, from the British Library, and I opened it up, and, and there it said, um, you know, John D something like 1574, and then it said, bought upon a stall in London. So my, my first question, which I think is a literary question is, um, is there evidence that he was reading that book because of its celestial voyage theme? And 
Then my, my second question concerns um, M.R. James, the, the author of you know, the famous ghost stories about medievalists. He, he has a, a bunch of characters who are, who are the villains in his, his stories. And they're the people who, who meddle with demons and people who meddle with occult knowledge and stuff. Um, do, do any of those people happen to have anything to do with D also, since he compiled the book on his manuscripts? Uh, well, thank you very much for these questions, and thank you very much for joining this session, first of all. Uh, the first question about the cotton uh, book. This is a fascinating publication pretty big one, and it was terribly expensive, especially when I acquired it. And this is the library catalog of John D. And uh, it's a facsimile of the original handwriting, what he compiled, actually compiled several catalogs over the years. And then uh, the scholars who, who published it, Roberts and Watson, very nicely went after the origin of all the books as much as it was possible to figure out. And it turns out that, that really John Dee was a fantastic bibliophile. He was buying books everywhere, wherever he went, and he ordered books from abroad. And uh, it's not a direct answer to your question, but one of the, the fascinating aspects of his library was the collection of Paracelsica. He re apparently read German because most of these books are in German edition, not only the Latin editions of, of Paracelsus, and he had something like 24, 25 books of Paracelsus. Which, which is uh, absolutely admirable and, and, and amazing, especially if we think of uh, uh, who wrote that famous book, The English Paracelsians. I, I can't remember the scholar now, for sure Ursula knows it or somebody else. But anyway, so uh, English Paracelsians. Uh, De Debus, yes, 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 Debus, thank you very much. So yes, that, that's, that's in itself a fascinating thing. And uh, another thing is that his library did not remain together. So it was scattered. Uh, many of the books have been recovered. Many of them are in the Wellcome Institute Library or other libraries in Britain or here and there. But the catalog is a proof of the whole, whole collection. And, uh, and that's a fantastic uh, cultural historical uh, relic. Now, if you allow me, I would like to show you three pages from another PowerPoint of mine when I gave a, a talk on D. And this shows the various cultural receptions which goes up to today. So Alistair Crowley, who was very much impressed by the Enochian magic, what, what D created. Then uh, Derek Jarman made a film, um, Jubilee, and in that John D appears as a character. Uh, Peter Aykroyd's uh, famous novel, The House of Dr. D. There, and one of the, the relatively recent stuff is Damon Albarn, a famous rock musician who wrote a rock opera about John D. and it was performed in 1011 in, uh, uh, in London. This is also a, a scene for that. It was pretty fascinating. So, sorry, did, did you see what I shared? I thought I was sharing, but I'm not so sure. Oh, uh, not not yet. I can't see. Uh, here it, it is. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Uh, very briefly, I can show it. This is Crowley. This is the German film, Peter Aykroyd and the rock opera, uh, which is a proof that John D is really a cultural hero. Actually, with an English colleague of mine, Roly Weimer, I wrote a, a study a couple of years ago when we presented John D as a cultural hero as a literary character, as an inspiration for musicals, dramas, films, etc., etc. So uh, obviously he has been inspiring with his life, with his ideas, with his magic, a, a great variety of, of people, not only scientists, but also artists. And uh, well, I don't want to switch back to the PowerPoint again. In the 17th and 18th centuries, there was a broadsheet circulating in England, which showed uh, Edward Kelly, who was the scryer of John D. Uh, both of them are standing in the cemetery and uh, a dead uh, person is coming out from the grave. This is a pretty famous uh, drawing. Obviously, nothing like that they did together. It's a legend, but it again shows the kind of hype which was going about John D. basically from the beginning. Uh, ben Johnson in the uh, play, in the comedy, The Alchemist, he has long references about John D. 
naming him actually concretely in that play. Uh, then there were other speculations, interpreters, uh, maybe even Clifford doubled in that to, to identify John D. with Prospero for, for, from Shakespeare as the, the white magician, etc., etc. So it's, it's basically an infinite story. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? In the meantime, I would like to thank Marcel for these very valuable philological uh, um, additions in the in the John the Dudich relationship. And I wish I had these when I wrote the book. Obviously, it would be there, but now uh, others can be credited with that. Yes, Ursula Shulakovska. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I just thought that perhaps we should focus on the issue of signs and symbols and recognize the magical enterprise that traces itself back to the Picatrix and perhaps to Hermes, but mostly to the Picatrix, then onwards through Agrippa and certainly through these monas and the whole emblematic tradition um, in which this was embedded because of course this was the time of emblem books some of which have hidden esoteric meanings and others are strictly games of linguistics and that in a sense um, i'm wondering about this issue of whether what we have here is a kind of de dematerialization of both of magic in the sense that what where something is happening is it's happening within the linguistics both in terms of visual emblems and their relationship to verbal emblems is still i don't think properly understood um, and, and and requires more research um, and it, it's like the practice of magic certainly you see it in alchemy becomes more and more something within the pages of a book and something that you do with your mind rather than going out and doing mucky things in graveyards with spirits and ghosts or mucky things in laboratories or rushing out under the under the moon though i think d d still did a lot of practical astronomy and did actually go outside and do these things um could, could, you, could you say something about your interest in emblems jury because this goes right back to your study of Elizabeth, Elizabethan poetry of Philip Sidney and, and of Shakespeare's emblems and, and where you think this as a linguistic, as an emblematic development and how that goes then forward into the 20th and 21st century. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Ursula. I think that this is a very interesting question and uh, leads us to the question of mediality. Mediality of culture, and the mediality of magic. And you are absolutely right that there are various uh, aspects of um, medial aspects of, of magic. Uh, and we can trace this throughout John Dee's career. Uh, he uh, dealt with astronomy and mathematics and the uh, Monas Hieroglyphica is very much based on geometry and uh, this kind of very scientific visualizations. But at the same time, he created a magic emblematic symbolic sign with the monas. Um, there's no time here to explain what is the meaning of the monas, but it's, a, it's an absolutely fascinating philosophical visual emblem, I would say. And then with the angel magic, he moves in the direction of language, exactly as you say, and prayers, incantations, and, and this kind of linguistic and non-material aspects will become very important in that magic. But let's not forget about the certain paraphernalia, what he used, the crystal ball, which is visual, the, the great seal, which was necessary for invoking the angel. So again, we have a combination of, or a kind of multimediality uh, of magic. Um, Absolutely important to remember John Dee's religiousness. Religion, piety was extremely important for him in combination with science. And if we go back to the first information of the Bible about the origin of humanity, what do we learn? That uh, God created the world by word, 
let be this and that. So this is a verbal act, but at the same time, he creates humanity in his own image, and we have the image. So word and image are intricately uh, linked together in Christianity as well, which was an important aspect of, of John Dee's thinking. Does it satisfy your interest? Yeah. Well, it, many, many other things could be told about emblematics, but that's what came to my mind first. There is a question in the chat. Uh, Kati Pickvans, uh, can you please tell us a little more what brought John D to Hungary and about this, his Hungarian connection, assuming that it was ongoing? Yeah, this is also a very interesting story. And uh, Noel already quoted that uh, John D. had a, a burning ambition to, to make a career. So he was this kind of ambiguous person that on the one hand, he wanted to get closer to God, to understand God's plans and projects. And that's why he went into the angel magic. But at the same time, he had uh, almost a dozen children, a huge family and a very costly living. So he tried to earn enough to to maintain his, his life, and he was looking for patrons. And at some point, he felt that uh, the English court didn't satisfy him up to the point he was expecting. And then he met this uh, Polish count, uh, uh, the uh, Lord Lasky or Waski in Polish, who was a very important political figure in Poland. And he told them that I will pay you well, I will take care of your family, come to my country and, and uh, do alchemy and uh, predictions and whatever is necessary at my court. So this is how they moved to Poland. And uh, in the end, he even got to the court of uh, King Stephen Bathory and had two auditions with Bathory. But again, he didn't get the proper uh, kind of appreciation what he hoped for. So they decided to move to Prague. And then again, he had auditions with Rudolf II and the, the Rudolfian court was very accommodating for the kind of characters as, as Dee and his uh, assistant Kelly were. But there are absolutely fascinating things, which, which is, with our modern mind, not so easy to understand that John D. goes to the emperor in a private audition and delivers a huge apocalyptic message to him in which he says that God tells through me to you that if you don't obey, he will step on you and throw you off your throne. Can you believe this situation <laughs> that an English wandering scholar tells this the emperor? in an audition. And then he was surprised that he didn't get the imperial mathematician title he was kind of applying for. So uh, very interesting psyches and personalities are there. So they spent a couple of years in, in Central Europe. From Prague, they moved to a, a country estate of a, 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 a Czech magnate, uh, the Rosenbergs in Trebon or Trebona. And finally, they went back to, uh, to England. So that's the story. And uh, again, many interesting details could be could be uh, elaborated on. Thank you, Tibor Fabini has the hands up. <laughs> right. Uh, well, thanks, Juris. I'm happy to see you and happy to see some uh, old friends like Clifford Davidson. It's a long time I met in Szeged. And uh, in fact, I uh, shared the same office this uh, year for uh, and we had some vivid discussions on Shakespeare, English Renaissance drama, emblems and so on. And uh, I knew that uh, apart from his uh, genuine interest in Shakespearean studies, he was interested also in Renaissance magic. And uh, myself, apart from my interest in Renaissance uh, and, and Shakespeare, I was also in 16th century theology. So unfortunately, we never uh, came to discuss the uh, relationship between uh, these magic and the reception of uh, his magic by contemporary uh, English uh, theologian and how he reflected upon these Protestant theologians. There were several important figures like Perkins and others. I just wonder uh, whether we have some uh, information about that. This is a very complicated issue, and I'm not absolutely at home in the intricacies of that. There's a recent book in which it was argued that John D. actually was an ordained Catholic priest, and he was kind of switching 
denomination from Protestantism to Catholic and, and back. And when he was in, in uh, Krakow in this uh, Central European tour, he went to take the communion to Hannibal Rosselli, which was a famous humanist uh, priest in Krakow at that time. So the, the, the situation is really complicated. Um, I understand D that he was an interconfessionalist or even supraconfessionalist in which the, 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 uh, the denominational doctrines were not so important, but what was important for him to establish a mystical link with God. And in that, it was not really important um, what denomination he would follow. Now, the reception is very interesting because until the second half of the 17th century, this is not really discussed in contemporaries. Everybody mentions D as a famous mathematician. Usually this is the, the phrase with which they, they refer to him, uh, contemporaries and, and the people in the first half of the 17th century. And then in the middle of the 17th century, the famous True and Faithful Relations was published by Mary Cossabon, the, the late humanist who... Uh, published John Dee's Angel Magic Diaries, and he wrote a 40 pages huge folio introduction to that, in which really he quite blackened the character of John Dee, suggesting that he was deluded by the devil, and his angel magic was nothing else but, uh, but uh, simply a trick by the devil. And then for quite a long time, that was the image that the deluded scholar who fell into, into some sort of trap uh, of the devil. But interestingly, the appreciation as a scholar goes on in the 18th century. Once I co collected a huge amount of quotations from the, the 18th century, what is it called, the 18th century books online or something like this, and several hundreds of John D. references I collected from that period. And, uh, and still, his reputation as a scholar and as a math mathematician is, is pretty important. And then in the, in the 19th century really comes the sensationalism, romanticism, and he emerges as a, as a mystical, romantic figure, the demonic, whatever. Other questions? Yes, yeah. before Davidson, please. Yeah. Uh, I uh, find this discussion very interesting. It takes me back a long ways. Uh, in fact, even further than my meeting with Yuri in 1980 at Dumblin. Uh, uh, I uh, got interested in Marlowe's Faustus very early and actually wrote my first published scholarly article uh, my first main publication in Studies in Philology in 1962, uh, which I wrote when I was still a graduate student, uh, well along towards finishing, uh, but um, very interested in, um, in, the, uh, in the power of the witches and, and, and uh, the kind of occult background for the witches that Shakespeare must have known. Um, going back, I'm sure, to Agrippa through the English regurgitations of, uh, of uh, Agrippa's theories um, along the way. And uh, so, um, so anyway, with failing memory and all that, uh, I'm still working and uh, still um, work through a lot of things, including vision theory, medieval, uh, medieval times the connection between touch and vision. When you see something, it is as if you are touching it. And I think that is, that is a, a, um, an insight that I think indirectly I gained from Yuri, along with a lot of other things. So thank you, Yuri. Thank you very much. And I'm extremely glad you are here with us. <laughs> thank you very much. I have a, a question to both of you, uh, uh, and, but mainly to Noel, uh, who uh, is still uh, giving us the occasion to, uh, for this discussion. Uh, and uh, at, uh, at the beginning, you said very uh, briefly that you changed the subtitles from science to magic on the one hand and doctrine of exaltation on the other hand. And later on, Yuri also told that actually this book was 
from science to magic, but we, it was not in his uh, subtitle anyhow. So, uh, why, uh, why did you, uh, uh, so could you give some more reasons for changing that? You probably discussed it with Yuri and he probably welcomed this change, but maybe it had something to do with your uh, first concentration on Agrippa, De Vanitate, uh, his famous treatise on, <laughs> <laughs> or or any other things is that also as relevant to uh, uh, John D as to Agrippa? Uh, thank you very much for that question, Gabor. Uh, first, let me let, let let's get back to the uh, original subtitle, and I will show what the problem was uh, for for me as a translator. So it goes: uh, magical exaltation through powerful signs. Well, linguistically, when you take this word sign, I had a problem with it. Uh, when you translate it into Serbian, you get something of, very, uh, of a very trivial meaning, if you understand me. So uh, I had two solutions. One was pretty bold, I would say, uh, to use the word symbol. But this I didn't dare do because then I would get into the difference between symbols and signs, which could be very tricky. Uh, and if I left signs as that, uh, as it, it, it says in the subtitle, then it would sound very, it might sound very misleading in Serbian and also not really, not really uh, informative of what uh, the meaning of the subtitle is. So then I thought about the, uh, uh, I, have to, I have to say that uh, this uh, subtitle as it is in Serbian, it was approved by jury. <laughs> of course, actually it was, there was, a little conversation. My first uh, uh, suggestion was slightly different. It was uh, between science and magic. Mm. Because, uh, you, you mentioned you mentioned oh, okay. Agrippa very rightly, and of course, while translating the work, I even subconsciously uh, compared it to Agrippa's case all the time. Of course, but then in, in uh, this case, we have a different paradigm. We have. Um, I would say bouncing to and through between two paradigms. This is why this was my experience, my my uh, uh, I would say impression when I read and also translated Yuri's book. Uh, that is why my first uh, suggestion was to uh, frame it as uh, between science and magic. But then after some discussion with Yuri, uh, actually he he liked he more like the idea uh, from from science to magic, and I just. Uh, of course, uh, respected that, and this is what what was how was it in the end. Uh, I don't know if this answers your question. Yes, uh, and how about the doctrine of exaltation, the other changing of the title? Well, it is pretty much straightforward, I would say, because it it also appears in uh, George's uh, subtitle, and. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to have a title that would be strong enough, that would be uh, clear enough about the, the main topic, the main theme of the book. And mm -hmm. I thought that uh, by uh, using this word, by picking up this word, I would give a very clear idea of what's what's uh, the main uh, the, the main uh, how would I say. Uh, 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 interpretation, Juris' in interpretation of what he wanted to do, because mm -hmm. exaltatio is actually Juris' term, not not this term. Yeah. Uh, and in this sense, I wanted just to to put it forth, you know, to uh, to emphasize it more. I don't know if it sounds too uh, off the road or maybe too too provocative in in comparison to the original title, or uh, trying to get behind your question. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. Uh, I, I greatly value the work of the translators and I think uh, uh, the real uh, way to uh, get in close uh, uh, relationship with uh, the thought of somebody with a text is, is just going uh, through it word by word and trying to rephrase it and translate it and then one confronts such problems where one has to join uh, uh, or provide an interpretation of the text and that's we have 
since Jerome and the Vulgate and many yes. other things. And, and I, I, I'm very glad that uh, uh, you engaged in this experience. But now let's just turn to Yuri. How, how uh, was that uh, work together on uh, the uh, consultation? I, I uh, experienced when uh, some of, well, not very important, but uh, some text had been translated. I realized that I was not clear at certain points. Actually, the translators pointed uh, to uh, certain things which helped me to clarify. Was that a similar type of experience? I would say that it was a very smooth cooperation. <clears throat> First of all, Noel is very independent, so I didn't have to interfere too much with that. I was very happy about the title. I think the title of choice is excellent, and I wish I had it in mind when I published the original. <laughs> and uh, what I was really sorry for, Noah, was the work with the index, uh, because it's a manual work, and I think that he really uh, sweat blood and tears while he compiled the, the Serbian index for that. I, I did. <laughs> but he did, yes. Yes. Yeah. To me, the greatest surprise was the form of my name when I saw it in the Serbian transliteration. <laughs> it was a kind of a cultural shock. <laughs> Actually, you might, you might notice, if I may add, you might notice that in Serbia we use both scripts, which might be quite confusing. We use the Latin script and we use the Cyrillic script. And we can use it interchangeably. So I, we, we could have printed this, this book uh, in the Cyrillic script as well. Uh, so it can contribute to, to this kind of confusion. Uh, yeah. Okay, let me ask uh, uh, once again if there is any further comment. Yes, please, Ursula Shulakovska. Um, coming back, Noel, to what you were saying about the, the lack of interest to date in um, the history of the esoteric tradition. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I was also mindful of when I was in Hungary, when somebody asked me why most scholars come from, uh, of the esoteric tradition, this was back in the 90s, um, came from Germany or came from Britain. And I think one has to ask about the role of the authorized religion in each of these geographical areas, which is that there's no question, although again, this is understudied, that the esoteric tradition as it arose with Dee and Paracelsus and Agrippa is related to the Protestant Reformation. Whereas what you've got in places like Hungary and Poland at that date is the counter-reformation pushing back Protestantism and also in Hungary. And also, of course, in Serbia, you've got the Orthodox Church. Now, this doesn't mean that there can't be isolated interests in um, the esoteric traditions. You need to only think of Russia, uh, where there was a strong alchemical tradition actually sponsored, I think, by Dee's son. Um, so uh, could you comment on this? Because I think this then goes down through the centuries into modern scholarship. And when I think of Poland, for example, the name that rises up is still only Rafał Prinka. I can't really think of many more people working there. And when I recently gave a lecture on alchemy in 20th, 20th century art at the Fine Art Academy in Gdańsk, it went down like a brick I think I have never had an audience which was less interested in what I had to say because it was just completely out of their cultural context. They'd never thought about it. Magic to them was something that old village women did, you know, related to herbalism. And they'd simply never ever encountered this other tradition at all. So do you think there's something like this in Serbia as well? Uh, thank you very much for this excellent question, because I, I've been thinking a lot about it. Uh, first of all, it is clear that uh, this situation is uh, historically conditioned. Uh, Serbia had its Middle Ages, of course, but Serbia didn't have its Renaissance. It was left, left out of it completely. 
So in this sense, you can understand uh, the, the lack of this kind of interest in scientific scholarly community. But then on the other hand, there is a very interesting discrepancy if you uh, watch uh, Serbian culture in general, which is, I have to say, you're very right that uh, the Serbian Orthodox Church is one of the most authoritative organizations in Serbia. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Serbia is a very secular country with uh, much of, of its, its culture and society being very secular and even anti-church to, to some extent. So uh, there is a very interesting situation that uh, if you watch culture at large, uh, you will see, we were, we were talking about this uh, disenchantment, re-enchantment pair. Uh, you will see uh, instances of re-enchantment very, very present in many layers of the society, in culture, in counterculture, counter in uh, literature, etc. So it, it's present there. Uh, you have, uh, I mentioned the Nemanja Radulovic, a colleague of mine from Belgrade, who uh, his book is really a great, great study on this. He shows, he uh, arguments that, uh, argues that uh, uh, all those, all those notions, all those ideas about that we collect, connect to esotericism, even to modern esotericism, going all the way to Crowley and his Otto or, or the Templarientis and Telema, Telemites. We have all, all these kinds of groups in Serbia. We, we've been having them for decades, even during socialist Yugoslavia. We had shamans, we had uh, uh, theo 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 theosophical society, uh, Freemasons, uh, anthrop you know, so there are all kinds of all kinds of uh, esoteric movements, groups, uh, books translated. For instance, we had a flood of Castaneda in the 70s and 80s. We have so many editions of Castaneda. So it, I wouldn't say that it's something new. This is exactly why I mentioned Nemanja and his study. Um, he also analyzed some of the um, canonical writers and poet, poets of Serbian uh, literature and he shows that uh, esoteric and occult uh, themes and motives were present even in the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, we have a famous Serbian um, poet, Vasco Popa, uh, whose uh, poetical world was entirely built on alchem alchemical symbolism. And then when you, when you see all this, then you realize that uh, this kind of I would say re-enchantment vector is missing only in the academic community, only there. So it begs the question, why, what's the reason for that? Uh, it, is, it is historically uh, um, conditioned, of course, but it also, I, I wouldn't overestimate the um, influence of the church in this respect, because as I say, uh, especially the academia is very, very much, very independent from the church, ideologically and financially and in any other way. So this, this remains an open question to me. Thank you very much for pointing it because that's all I can say about it for the moment. Thank you. Uh, Tibor Fabini wanted to comment this. Well, not, uh, that's a different uh, question to Noel, but if uh, George, uh, George wants to... I, I just wanted to, to add one sentence to what Noel said, and in a way, uh, contrary to Ursula, I'm sorry to say this, that there is the Senas where this famous little organization, what we refer to several times, and that shows that there are a younger generation of scholars in all of these countries who started uh, uh, researching this. And actually in Poland, there has been going on a book series in Polish, uh, the kind of archives of uh, Polish esotericism, and they've already published 15 volumes, mostly 19th century and early 20th century stuff. So that means that there is a, a huge scholarly interest in that. That was my little addition. So my question is to Noel. Uh, I know that uh, the Hungarian um, speaker, uh, Hombash, his Hom Bila Hombash's work uh, is translated, or most of his works are translated into Serbian by Sava Babic. I, I just wonder what is uh, his reception uh, in Serbia and how is his reception related to the publishing activity that you have uh, mentioned to us? 
Bela Hamvash is a cultic figure in Serbia, actually. I have to say it. And uh, also uh, Sava Babic, I think that Yuri, he met Sava Babic at some point or his daughter, I can't remember anymore. Anyway, I think he, he translated everything that Bela Hamvash wrote. And I remember that we, we were, my brother and I, we were buying those books while we were teenagers, some of them, like Ciencia Sacra and uh, others. And uh, there's, I, there's nothing more to say than what, what I just said, that he's one of the cultic figures on, on the level of Castaneda in this popular con consciousness, for, for instance. Uh, his novels are a little less accepted than his, how would they say, uh, books of revelational uh, insights, su such as the Scientia Sacra. He, his, uh, his novels have been translated in recent years. Sava Babic died, died, of course, but there is another uh, young scholar. His name is Marko Trudic, and he is in charge of the Hungarian studies in at Belgrade Faculty of uh, Philology. And actually, he helped me a lot with uh, transcription of Hungarian names uh, while I in, in this translation. So I think he took up Sava Babic's uh, role as translator of uh, some of the uh, some of those uh, works that Sava didn't translate, and those were mainly uh, uh, Hamash's novels, as I said. But they are not that popular. Well, the book has been presented, and uh, we are very grateful for this opportunity. And I think uh, the opportunity is uh, mainly due to your uh, uh, diligent work, Noel, of uh, translating, but it uh, was somehow uh, presented now as a very beautiful and enviable uh, uh, professor-student uh, relationship, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, getting into a real intellectual and scholarly cooperation. And, uh, uh, the idea of uh, Yuri to uh, have this conversation here on this uh, was an excellent idea, which turned out to be a real workshop on this topic. Thank you also for uh, the participants who contributed to this and uh, who were interested in this. And thank you all. I think that concludes very well the uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much thank all for coming today. Thank you very much. It was a very, very kind event. And I guess that both Doyle and me are very happy about it. So thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing this with us. Thank you, Gabor, for moderating and everybody else who came. Well. Thank you and bye-bye. And bye -bye. I've just bye -bye. learned that Danuta is in the Stephansdom in Vienna. So that fantastic Gothic backdrop was intriguing me all along. <laughs> Okay, bye bye everybody. Bye bye. Thank That's you, bye, the Himmel's bye. lighter, forgetting the heaven. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. bye.